All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College and as part of the Rankin Technical College AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies course, I've been going through a series of video presentations or been creating a series of video presentations based on the Mozilla Developer Network Learn Web Development series. I'm in the CSS module, Talking Layout, and we're getting into talking about legacy layout methods. And again, what we're talking about is before the days of things like CSS Grid and CSS Flexbox, you had to kind of do the same type of thing by hand. And there are still many legacy systems out there that have done things in this way. So this is what they're talking about. Okay. So, in the example that we've got right now that looks like this, notice that if I close, if I shrink this down, it's not responsive. All right, so in other words, each one of these has a fixed, um, a fixed width, okay? And that's pretty much what they're saying in here. It says what we really want is a flexible or fluid grid that will grow and shrink. It says to achieve this, we can turn the reference pixel widths into percentages by doing something like this. It says for our column width, our target is 60 pixels and our content is 960 pixel wrapper, so we can use this. So we're talking about 6.25%. All right. So it says to get started here, we need to make a new copy of the previous page or make your local copy. So let's just grab this one. So again, the idea is to come in here and do what we were just doing, but make it responsive. All right, so we're back to here. Okay. And again, this is not responsive. Okay. Update the second CSS rule with a wrapper selector as follows. Okay, I don't think we changed the body at all. Let's see. Oh, we did. Previously, it had a width of 980 and a margin of zero auto. Now we're giving it a max width. Okay. All right. Now when we do this, is you know we're going to build this incrementally, as they've been doing it. So. Okay. It looks a little funky right now. Looks like it's getting to at least be more um, responsive. Next, update the fourth rule, the one with the call selector, as follows. Now, the bad thing, so to speak, in this, and they mention this in here, is the fact that doing all this stuff take some work all right and you have to do you know may possibly sit down and figure out you know exactly what you're doing etc so update the bottom block of css rules with this now the example here was nice why because they did it because we didn't have to sit there and figure all this stuff out that's not typically going to be the case where you can just go, you know, click and go into Google or whatever. You This is work you might have to very well do yourselves. All right, so let's look at that. And now notice that it indeed is responsive. Okay, all right.
It says you could use the calc function to do the math right inside of your CSS if you wanted to do that as well. And they give an example here. Okay. So it says try replacing this and we should see the same result. But again, they're doing calculations right inside of there. And the idea is after we do this and refresh, it should look exactly the same and it should behave the same. Okay. All right. Semantic versus unsemantic grid systems. Adding classes to your markup means that your content and markup become tied to your visual presentation. You will sometimes hear this is CSS classes being described as being unsemantic rather than the semantic use of classes. So again, what they are talking about more than anything else is as you go through and start to do this stuff, when you use things like grid and flexbox, some of this is going to be automated for you. Okay, all right. It says, if you were to use a preprocessor such as SAS, which I don't know if we're going to talk about or not, you could create a mixin. What SAS is, is it's a CSS preprocessor, which allows you to take SAS, or to take CSS and, and make it more of a programming language where you can create variables and do some more programmatic types of features. All right. Enabling offset containers in the grid. It says, the grid we have works well as long as we want to start all the columns flush with the left hand. If we need to have an empty column space, etc., it's more work. And it says, what does that mean? It means more math. All right. I'm not going to grab the example here. I'm just going to go down and it says, let's create a class in our CSS that will do this and replace it. All right. And it says, let's just look at their live example here. So it works the same, but it's moved over now from where it was previously. All right, so the example that we had look like this. And the example that they have in here looks like that. Okay. When using a system like this, you do need to take care that your total widths add up correctly, so you don't want any math errors. Also bear in mind that if the content gets wider than the rows they occupy, it will overflow and it will look very amateurish. The biggest limitation of this system, it says, is that essentially it's one-dimensional. When we're dealing with columns and spanning elements across columns but not rows, here it's very difficult with these older layout methods to control the height. It's very difficult using these, period, because there's more work that you have to do yourself. All right. In the previous, one of the previous Flexbox lessons, it says you might think Flexbox is an ideal solution for creating a grid system. However, Flexbox was never designed as a grid system and poses a new set of challenges when it's used as one. All right. So we can create something that looks like this. It may look better, it may not, but remember, as they say right here, by its very nature, Flexbox is one dimensional by design. It deals with a single dimension, so with a row or with a column. You can't create, as it says here, a strict grid for rows and columns. You may be able to use it and add some hacks and get it to look pretty much the way that you want it to look, or you may not. All right, third-party grid systems. I've never worked with Foundation. I've done work with Bootstrap before. It's getbootstrap.com, all right, and you'll notice that they're up to version 5. The last one I worked with was like 443. What's kind of nice about this, I just want to show you it very quickly. I'm going to click the Getting Started, and let's see. We'll grab this starter template just so you can see it. So I'm going to replace what we had here with this starter template. It won't look like anything, so don't let that throw you. All 
right? And if we come in here then, it's going to have just, I think, just a simple hello world on it, nothing else. There, that's it. So you're like, well, who cares? Why would we need that? Well, what's nice about using Bootstrap is that you can go out and just start grabbing things. And for instance, let's just say that I want to come in here and I want to form. All right. So I can come in here, overview. So here's a form. So all I do is I grab this code that's right here, copy it to my clipboard, get rid of what's in here in that hello world and replace it with that. Control S. Refresh. And there's my form, which is, well, at least I thought it was going to be um, responsive. But, I mean, no work on my part. So I'd have to do a little work, I guess, to make it responsive. So I can come in here and let's say that I want, uh, there's the grid, et cetera, content. What do we want here? Examples. So there's all sorts of stuff that this will do in an automated in an automated way for you is what I want to get to. All right. I don't want to get off on too big of a tangent here. I think that's good for right now. And we have now gone through the legacy. Next is the supporting older browsers. And as it says in this module, we recommend using Flexbox and Grid as the main layout methods for your designs. However, there'll be visitors who will use older browsers that don't support that. So that's what this is about. We'll be back with that in just a couple minutes.